bored no more. Nice and comfy, man. Cozy. <laughs> Cozy and comfy. Hello, gentlemen. Are you guys there? Oh, yo, yo, yo. yo what's up? <laughs> what's going on? Uh, how are you guys doing today? Doing yeah. pretty well, man. Yeah, doing pretty well. How you doing? Good, good. A little nervous. Did not sure what what to expect and how this is gonna roll. But you know, we do things all like weird and stuff. So I'm sure it'll be fine. Hey, yeah, we do things weird too. So I guess <laughs> we're all in good company, man. Awesome, awesome. Manny, can we t- throw up the, the volume a little bit on Synaxis? Sorry, gentlemen, I'm just going to get uh, Manny to throw up the volume there. Oh, yeah, uh, I can so get closer, too. So. Oh, um, whatever. You guys comfortable? Nice and comfy, man. Cozy. <laughs> cozy and comfy. It's good oh. to be on with you, man. I feel like we haven't talked in a bit. Yes. It's been a while. It's been a while, for sure. And uh, I got a lot more planned f- w- with you guys as well, so... It, it, you know, it'll, uh, we'll, we have a lot coming down the pipeline that we definitely want you guys involved in. So there'll be a Great. lot of times when we talk. Right on. But uh, do you guys uh, want to give us a little heads up on what we're going to be uh, experiencing here with the with your segment? And then when uh, when you guys are done, I'll, I'll jump on. We'll have a little conversation after you guys cool. are done. Um, so Manny will give you guys, uh, what is it, a 10-minute warning or five-minute warning, right? Five-minute and two-minute. Five-minute and a two-minute warning. So what do you guys got for us? Well, essentially, we were just going to do sort of like a book review slash interview review yeah. of um, the conversation we just had with John Kleisick, who is a big brain uh, professor who wrote this uh, crazy book about technocracy and the corporatization of the education system. Mm-hmm. So I've got a bunch of notes in here, and hopefully we can make sense of them because it's 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 a lot it's pretty dense yeah but, um we'll get into it try to break it down it was dense and a little bit like black pilling but we'll try to leave out the black pills and make it <laughs> digestible i noticed when i watched the video i noticed but i think it's i think it's uh, important information that people have to like to learn about and uh, you know for a lot of people that might be surprised to realize how deep this goes yeah all right gentlemen have yourselves a good show i'll catch you guys at the end thanks man adios <clears throat> so hey everybody this is jordan from the synaxis podcast and this is josh and we have been asked by our gracious host mano to share with you some of the things we've been up to most recently if you are subscribed to our channel you would have noticed that we dropped an interview with author john kleisek who wrote a book entitled school world order the technocratic globalization of corporatized education it's a mouthful. It's a brain full. It's incredibly dense. There's a lot of citations. It's very well cited and well written. And I guess we'll just get into it. Um, maybe the first thing we should talk about is just like our initial takeaways from from reading his book and talking to the man himself. Um, you got anything for that? He's a really likable guy. Not only is he intelligent and well-read, he's a super likable guy. Like after our conversation, I think we sat in the Zoom call for like 40 minutes just like talking and hanging out. He's a really cool guy. I like him a lot. Yeah, and on on top of that, we also have like a part two um, coming out sometime, hopefully soon. Um, because John, he, he had, one of the reasons he wanted to come on our show was he wanted to talk about his journey to orthodoxy. He's a, an orthodox catechumen now after his uh his journeys through philosophy and search for meaning and that's that's going to be a good one too um in this one we got into just like the dark corners of 
of the education system and technocracy, but there's there's definitely a light in the darkness. So hopefully we can underline that too. Um, yeah, as I said, the book uh, came out of his uh, research. He worked alongside Charlotte Iserby, who she has a lot of her own writings. She wrote a book called The Dumbing Down of America. Mm -hmm. She worked on the Reagan administration's Board of Education. And so she had some inside knowledge of some of the shady things they were doing. She, uh, she stumbled on this thing called Project Best, um, which stood for better education skills through technology. And she kind of, she essentially characterized it as an attempt to undermine duly elected school boards and uh, set up an education system that would be manipulated by corporate uh, oligarchical interests. Um, and so, John hooked up with her, uh, and he had his own misgivings about the education system in his uh, the area, which was in Illinois. He talks about how the governor of Illinois at the time, Bruce Rauner, he denied a budget for the school system in the area, and it seemed to be like a bait and switch in order to put a new charter school system into uh, Chicago schools, which uh, you, you hear all these buzzwords about charter schools and school choice and everything. And Charlotte Iserby said that that was a Trojan horse to uh, reform the school system um, and sub subordinate American educational policy um, to the jurisdiction of publicly unaccountable private corporations that siphon tax dollars to subsidize the exit, the executive decisions of their unelected councils. Um, John Kleisak wrote that on page 29 of his book. So <clears throat> yeah, well, the way a lot of this works is through public private partnerships. So it, it's a way to use the state and in this way that seems good. It's like, oh, we'll team up with these corporations and our state run schools, they end up being like um, undermined by the globalist corporations in like a subtle way that's not always clear from the outset. Like I remembered going to a charter school and thinking it was really cool. And it is one of those things that since the boards are unelected, they, um, oh, I'm like blanking. Well, they can implement policies um, without the consent of the people in the area. Yeah. And some charter schools are better than others. And he even mentioned that um, a lot of them right now have a certain amount of freedom, but since they're tied up with this kind of funding from above, then it could easily turn into a much more tyrannical situation in the future. Um, and when you get, when you start digging into this stuff, you find all, all of the, uh, usual suspects, I mean, like the Rockefellers, the Gates Foundation, Skull and Bones is a huge one that keeps coming up. Uh, another another researcher that he worked with was An Anthony Sutton, who was also close with Charlotte Iserby because it turns out her- Her dad. Her dad and her grandpa were members of Skull and Bones. So she had all of these private uh, articles and paperwork and uh, like, rosters of yeah, the members the, the of, list of the members she leaked it to anthony sutton and he ended up writing um america's secret establishment an introduction to the order of skull and bones which really brought into the public light the idea of skull and bones and kind of kind of a more common idea of somewhat of a secret society or societies within colleges that have maybe goals that aren't open to most people yeah and so and, and then when you when you look into these skull and bones men, there's a really great chapter in John's book that kind of draws a line from the Bavarian Illuminati back in like the 1700s with Adam Weishaupt, and and he can kind of trace the members of the Illuminati to into the Prussian military school system, which was one of the sort of precursors to what we're seeing now, which had a lot to do with Hegelian theory. And um, they were trying to like sort of mold this 
uh, de-individualized citizenship through education. Um, and it wasn't about like liberating their minds or teaching them critical thinking. It was about making them good workers and good members of society, which, you know, I mean, I guess that that has its pros and cons yeah. depending on who's holding the, the reins to this kind of system. But, um, so the idea of like the, the Hegelian dialectic is a big theme in John's book. And he opens, opens up the book with, uh, sort of breaking that down. I'm sure people who are into this kind of stuff already know the idea of like the Hegelian dialectic, the thesis antithesis or synthesis, um, but, pe oh, but people usually end up hearing it. I think the first time I ever heard it was David Icke, yeah. like a long time ago, talking about problem reaction solution. If you want to get something done, you create a problem in which there's a reaction from the public and that you pose your, your you poise yourself to be the solution to kind of get what you want ahead of time. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, it was in, but Hegel and the idea of thesis, antithesis, synthesis was very influential through philosophy. Like I, I've heard philosophers say that everything after Hegel is somewhat of a reaction to Hegel. So there's lots of people and philosophers and influential people have taken this idea and have realized that when there's an extreme somewhere, there's usually some bounce back to the other extreme. If something's too much of something in a system, it goes to the other direction. Yeah, so, pendulum swing. Yeah, it's a pendulum swing. It's like a common anecdote. And uh, Anthony Sutton, who we mentioned in his book, he, he underlines this too. And he says that, the order of skull and bones uses the, the Hegelian dialectic to manipulate outcomes, in this case specifically within the education system. Progress in the Hegelian state uses, oh, is, sorry. Progress in the Hegelian state is through contrived conflict. The clash of opposites makes for progress. If you can control the opposites, you dominate the nature of the outcome. And the example that John Kleisek gives at the beginning of his book, uh, it goes back to Governor Bruce Rauner. Um, let me actually pull this up. It's on page eight. Yeah, and this is when he he did so he slowed down where he was supposed to pass something in a certain amount of time, and he didn't do it. <clears throat> yeah. So so for for this situation, the thesis or the problem is that. The old guard Democrat machine <clears throat> racks up the state of El Illinois' debt crisis until it threatens to collapse into insolvency. Um, so like we said, the, uh, the school system in Illinois had a budget crisis, which uh, was apparently the old guard Democrats did that. And then the antithesis or the reaction to that is Republican Governor Rauner halts state and federal funds for education in order to stop the budgetary cancer from metastasizing as a result the synthesis or the solution is public education institutions without public funds will ultimately be forced to seek financing from the private sector and undergo privatization through charter school partnerships and voucher programs so and and that's where we see like this sort of handoff between the democrats and the republicans um trying to use this conflict to synthesize this new solution that they already wanted to implement, which is these, uh, this charter school system that has no oversight from the public, basically. It's, the, it's those public-private partnerships that we brought up earlier, where they use public funds um, to implement private sector corporatized uh, uh, agendas, essentially. <clears throat> yeah, and Azerbit ended up saying school choice is nothing more than a code word for fascistic privatization of public education. Yeah, so we hear all these buzzwords, school choice, charter schools, workforce training, cradle to career, and all of that kind of comes out of the same philosophy that's that he traces back to the Prussian military education. Um and it has to do, like we said, with like de-individualizing a person and conditioning them to be basically blank slates um, to be manipulated by the government. Um, so that and that brings us into these uh, the psychoanalysts and psychological behaviorists that came up um, 
later on. Oh, and we see them on the screen right there. John B. Watson, John Dewey, G. Stanley Hall. Um, in the interview, John Kleisek did a really great breakdown of, of the kinds of experiments that these guys were doing. Uh, B.F. Skinner is another big one. He's there. a well-known one. Yeah. yeah. Um, but John B. Watson, he did something called the Little Albert Experiment, um, which had to do with with uh, Pavlovian conditioning on children. So he he took this baby named Albert and tried to see if they could make him scared of rabbits. Oh, that's what's going to be on yeah. screen. Yeah. So they would <laughs> put a rabbit in front of him, and at first he liked it because it's warm and cuddly, but then every time he they had the rabbit near him, they would pound. they make uh, loud noises or startling kind yeah, of Yeah, they thing. would make startling noises to condition him to be afraid of the rabbit. And then it, it got to the point where just like white fuzzy things uh, terrified him. Yeah. So people would come in with a mask with that's like a rabbit mask and it would, it would have like a transfer of the same kind of thing. So you start associating anything with the similar shape to the kinds of fear associations that happened at the same time. Yeah. And, and something that John Kleisek does that he's, he ties this sort of experiment into um, the, what we see in Brave New World, it's like a fictionalized version of the same thing. At the beginning of Brave New World, they have a bunch of the test tube babies, and and these are like the lower, the lower caste, like the deltas and the epsilons, who are supposed to be the servants in this new society. They condition them to hate books and flowers, flowers so that like critical thinking and nature is abhorrent to them. So they put books and flowers in front of them, and they they play like this really startling, these startling sounds and they shock them. They use shock treatment to just make them, to condition them to hate these things. And um, this sort of behaviorism, this idea of like a stimulus response is the basis for a lot of these educational theories that are coming from uh, some of these uh, insane people. And they're super influential in uh, what we see in the education system today. Because Julian Huxley, obviously, was Aldous Huxley's brother. He was the head of UNESCO, which I don't have it in front of me what that um, anagram stands for. But UNESCO has to do with the United Nations. And UNESCO is the United Nations for Education, Sciences, and Culture. That's right. Yeah, nice. And uh, so they and they have a lot to do with ma making educational policies as well. Um, and coming up to today, there there have been all of these. Uh, oh, nice! Look at this. We got we have our own Jamie. Pull it up. <laughs> Sick. Pull it up, Jamie. Um, UNESCO. Yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> we could tell you could take everything in John's book and make the craziest conspiracy board with it. Yeah. Which I wish we had time to do it. Yeah. Van Pull it up, Vanny. <laughs> What's up, Vanny? Pull it up, Vanny. Um, uh, so yeah, there's so many places to go from this because it, it has its tentacles and in, in all these things that affect us today. Uh, behaviorism, psychology, all of this stuff. Uh, some of the things that he brings up are, are, are the new technologies that have been implemented um, that also have their roots in B.F. Skinner, B.F. Skinner's um, Skinner box. It, it, th that was sort of the precursor to like um, virtual learning and, and almost like the uh, multiple choice tests and things mm -hmm. like that. Or it's just like you you just learn to to give the correct response to a yeah. certain stimulus and uh, and now it's become so uh, wrapped up in new educational technologies adaptive learning software um, we can talk about Ray Kurzweil sorry if this is all over the place like it's a lot of stuff to break down, but Ray Kurzweil, people might know as 
one of the big uh, transhumanist advocators. Yeah. He's a guy, I think, who coined the term singularity. Yes. And yeah, he's one of those guys that was like a pre-Brian Johnson who takes like 100 pills a day to try to stay young forever and looks at death like a, like a serious sickness. I think his dad died in like a pretty traumatic way and it affected him. And now he's all about um, overcoming death and wants to put his brain into machines. He wrote a book called Age of Spiritual Machines. Yeah, The Age of Spiritual Machines. In 1990, he wrote a book called The Age of Intelligent Machines. Um, and he kind of made this prediction that by the end of the first decade of the next century, which was around 2010, computer-assisted instruction or virtual education would be characterized by the following eight developments. This is from Kleizek's book on page 93. Every child has a computer. Computers are ubiquitous as pencils and books. They are portable laptop devices about the size of a large book. They include very high resolution screens that are easy to read. They include a variety of devices for entering information. Uh, they support high quality two-way voice communication, including natural language understanding, extremely easy and intuitive to use, um, so on and so forth. And John makes this connection between the Kurzweil's predictions and um, something that President Barack Obama, one of his initiatives called Connect Ed, uh, which plugged every student into a virtual learning module. Um, and that happened in 2013. This is still from Kleizek's book. Um, according to White House archives, the Connect Ed initiative was launched to connect 99% of American students in their classrooms and libraries with next generation broadband and wireless connectivity within five years to meet the needs of competition, competition in a global economy. And these are John's words, fueled by public private partnerships, Connect Ed is bankrolled by the Federal Communications Commission and private sector companies that have committed to provide schools across the country with more than $2 billion worth of free hardware, software, educational content, and wireless creativity, connectivity. Um, <clears throat> so all of that to say that this, uh, there, there's this movement to towards technocracy and plugging everybody into this sort of uh, tech hive mind almost with, with this ed tech, educational technology, and which, which is all based on this sort of behavioral psychology of stimulus and response. Yeah, there's no internal self. It's just everything's just a response to what comes before it. It's like a biological determinism. <clears throat> Yeah, and so like a lot in the in the video we kind of compared uh, Skinner and Yuval Harari. They both have this same sentiment that free will uh, is non-existent. It's just a myth, and um, that's just kind of their their view of human nature as as this bio computer that can be programmed, hackable animals, as Yuval Harari puts it. Um, and it's all just about sort of training the correct uh, response to stimuli instead of cultivating like a, a thinking, feeling individual. I think Harari uses the analogy that consciousness is like the hum of an engine on an airplane, that it's a byproduct of a process going on, that it's not like an internal driver or any kind of soul or metaphysical thing. It's just a byproduct of something that's already happening so because they think it's that way that everything can just be controlled through initial um, functions and processes yeah exactly and um, <clears throat> and then and that also ties into things like data mining and social uh, credit score um, John John pointed us to this uh, kind of disturbing I think it was a Wall Street Journal report on some of the technology they, they started um, piloting in China where they show a bunch of the children connected to these like headsets that read their brain waves and they're able to measure their attention uh, levels and, and they mine all this data from them. And it's just like, to me, it feels just like this really intrusive Orwellian Huxley a nightmare 
and I can't, I, when I was in school, I already felt like this sort of unnamed feeling of, of tyranny that I couldn't articulate, but I can't imagine being in a school like that today. I, I don't even know what schools are like anymore. It's been so long since I've been in one. Um, and it's kind of, kind of terrifying to think about. But, and we just, so we just brought up Obama's Connect Ed initiative, and then you bring that into the future a little bit more, and we get into, like, Betsy DeVos, who was Trump's uh, head of education. Mm -hmm. She had this thing called NeuroCore, which sort of furthered the, the same agenda of using, like, these wearable ed tech. Um, I think she called it bio... Biofeedback, biofeedback training, um, and that's 52. page fifty-two. I'm gonna pull up the way that John describes that because that's sort of the next step in this. Neurocore programs. Okay, so Neurocore, they they sort of put it forth as as a treatment for things like ADHD and, and neurodivergent conditions. And um, on page 52 of John's book, he talks about the NeuroCore methodology, which reprograms ADHD by utilizing quantitative electroencephalography to monitor brainwave responses to video stimuli. Whenever ADHD patients exhibit an undesirable brainwave response that indicates distraction, the video stimuli is halted or altered until the patient exhibits a focused brainwave response that indicates concentrated attention. Um, so yeah, they'll show them some kind of video, and then if if they sense any kind of like lapse in attention, then it'll give them kind of some kind of stimulus to pull them back in by either like pausing the video. pausing the video or, or or like vibrating a little bit or something like that, <clears throat> and. Um, this kind of, this is just more of that like behavioral conditioning. Um, and we see this also in some of the, ex the uh, experimental things that Amazon was doing in their warehouses. They, yeah. they had devices, I forgot what the name of those devices were, but they, they also monitored like the, the, the attention spans of their employees and then, and also like what, what they were doing. So if they did, something wrong then it would sort of like not shock them but make an annoying sound <laughs> yeah make an annoying sound and vibrate with some discomfort to like bring them back in uh to attention and stuff like that so we're, we're seeing these kinds of things that that just to me it's just like a a technocratic nightmare like um yeah orwellian just, just all this orwellian stuff and you can see how this trans even outside of schools, like this kind of technology could be used to like, like, oh, you don't want to watch your ad. It just pauses. You can't get back to whatever yeah. you're watching unless you're looking at the screen because they can use cameras and like all this stuff can be fed in. But yeah, you, through brain waves and brain states, you can definitely tell if someone's paying attention to a thing or, you know, if, if they're in a focused, attentive state rather than like zoning off. So that's how a lot of this data was gathered. And so, yeah, and so this gets into, like, just this really intrusive sort of uh, panopticon, uh, like, AI techno um, nightmare system that's constantly reading people's biofeedback, their heart rates, and their brain waves, and um, you, you can imagine this turning into something that is... It's a Black Mirror episode. Yeah. I mean... My, I brought this up in our interview with him too. The technology goes back a long way. It must have been like 12 or 13 years ago and I was at Burning Man and someone from like Stanford or Harvard, like one of the, the big educational institutions brought like a an early version of this kind of thing where they put like a headset on you that has a bunch of like uh, little reader positions that they attach to your skin and if whatever brain state you're in, it lights up all these lights. So it, it'll all be white. And if you can change your brain state, it'll turn to blue or to red. And this was a long time ago. And I remember thinking it was really cool at the time, having no inclination that it would be used towards, you know, to try to control people and guide them into a certain way of thinking. I just thought it was a cool kind of new technology, but this was a long time ago. So I'm sure the technology now has really come a long way. 
Yeah, and I think it, it kind of dovetails into the implementation of like AI teachers replacing human teachers. So, and we're seeing this getting rolled out in some places now too, with like little robot AI um, tutors that kids are interacting with. Um, even John said when he was teaching, I'm not sure which school he, I don't know if he mentioned which school he was teaching at, but he said that they started implementing um, the IBM Watson Copilot, which is like this AI. It was supposed to be like a teacher's aid, but that was a, a signal to him that maybe soon they would be trying to uh, make human teachers redundant yeah. in the near future. And you can look up, um, I think from 2011, there's a video of IBM's Watson AI competing in Jeopardy. And it won. I think it won. Um, if I remember right, I know Ken Jennings was competing against it and some other like top Jeopardy champion. Um, it's, it's pretty crazy. Like all the AI stuff is so mind boggling to me. Um, and I don't really understand it to tell you the truth, but yeah, it, <laughs> it's just a lot. There's there's so much information about all this stuff, and and we we brought up Betsy DeVos uh, after bringing up the Obama administration. So there there's like this, like I said, there's a theme running through the book of the Hegelian dialectic of passing from the right hand to the left hand, and that's sort of one of one of the main points that John Kleisick is trying to drive home that is it kind of feels really black pilling is that both sides of our political party seem to be working towards the same goal um yeah it kind of just ends up working out that way there's usually a lot of people in the background of cabinets too who will work for many different presidents whether like liberal or conservative like henry kissinger like people who've just yeah lived in the white house in some position for 50 years or something and yeah it does seem like it goes <clears throat> back and forth between like you know conservatives trying to be fiscally responsive responsible and then you know they're then liberals going towards another position and it just kind of bounces back and forth in this dialectic but it really does aim towards this like convergence of technology and corporations and a state private run kind of uh duo that ends up bad yeah. And another thing he brings up in the book uh, is Steven Mnuchin, who was Trump's treasurer. I forgot exactly what his position was. He was in Trump's cabinet and he, he helped draft one of the, uh, the tax bills. And he sort of put into that. He, he's Secretary a bonesman, of Treasury. Secretary yeah. of Treasury. And he was a bonesman and he, he wrote into that legislation a, a, a diverting a lot of tax public tax funds to automation and robotics um which john sees as kind of a red flag and another step in the the skull and bone secret society plan to enslave our minds <laughs> and uh so it does start to get pretty dark when you're reading into this stuff um but I don't, I don't necessarily want to, like, I don't want to black pill anybody and tell, tell you that it's hopeless because I don't believe that. Yeah. Um, obviously. But it does kind of validate, I think you brought up in the, uh, in the interview that it feels like ripping up the floorboards and having mold under there. It's like something you might've suspected was bad. And then you look into this and you're like, I was right. This turns out to be really bad. This sucks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it can start to get really scary. But um, I mean, I, I've always thought about like my time in public education and um, I seem to be doing all right now. And I've always thought of the analogy of like a, like a flower growing through the cracks in the concrete, like kids are resilient. Yeah. And, um, <clears throat> and ultimately we, we believe in God and that he's the one who has the last say in all this stuff. So we can, you can read the plans of these megalomaniacal insane people 
and start to feel like, oh no, like it's all is lost. They they have all the money, they have all the power and influence. Like, what can we do to stop them? And it's like they don't have as much power as they project. They think they do, but like they're blinded by prelates. Yeah. And um, I made the other analogy of like they they're basically like Indiana Jones villains who, when they get what they want, it'll ultimately destroy them. Destroy them. Yeah. And uh, God wins in the end. Yeah. So there's nothing to be afraid of. And he gives us these battles to uh, help in our salvation. So I want, I wanted to at least, I don't know how much time we got left, but I wanted to at least end on a, on a high note, which, which John does too. Um, or at least he tries to. And, and then he gets into the idea of like what what can we do in our own spheres to sort of combat this and homeschool obviously is a big yeah. thing trying to um, get back to classical education um, implementing things like the trivium and the quadrivium yeah um, which is definitely something you don't learn in public schools anymore where no. it was with the foundation of more traditional kinds of education. Yeah, so yeah, we, maybe we should break that down. Like the trivium is logic, rhetoric, and grammar. Yeah. And the quadrivium is mathematics, geometry, um, astronomy, and music. Yeah. So it's like it, it's the building blocks for all of education. You get language, you get logic, and, and um, the quadrivium is applying numbers to space and time, essentially. Yeah, the quadrivium, yeah, that's how I ended up hearing it, that arithmetic is applying number in the abstract, geometry is applying number in space, music is applying number in time, and astronomy is number in space and time. Yeah, and, and this is what they, uh, they use in classical education, like we said. I, I went to a classical study school for a while, and um, I ended up dropping out. And also, there there's kind of a, a weird Masonic element to that school that I think ended up kind of breaking people's minds and towards the end. But um, my my point in bringing that up was like we at, at that school we studied Euclid's um, elements, we studied Ptolemy's. Astron astronomical calculations and uh, up through Kepler and we I mean all of these different it was a great books program so we studied Plato and the philosophers and went up to Dante um, but I say all that because uh, it really does give, give you a foundation of critical thinking in, in philosophy that's important that helps sort of individualize you and I was thinking about We've been working on, we, we want to do a podcast on the Romanian prison camps, which I think dovetails with this nicely because it has a lot to do with the communist regime trying to implement Pavlovian psychology to break the soul of of the Romanians to turn them into perfect communists. And uh, Father George Calci was one of the priests that was in these prison experiments in Romania. And I remember him talking about how um, he was being driven mad by the kinds of tortures they were putting him through. And obviously he prayed like he, he had never prayed as deeply as he, he did in there. But also he talks about drawing um, Euclid's geometrical propositions on the wall to help keep him sane because the, like, the logic in those like, gave him a certain kind of stability. Um, like contemplating the... <laughs> The, there's there are actual laws in in order that helped him keep his mind from fracturing yeah which i think is a really powerful thing so um one of the comments said start a co-op or school with your local parish if you can it's a great idea oh yeah it's a great oh, idea for sure um same in the prisons yeah definitely same in the prisons is going to be part of that yeah being embodied in the local parish is such a good thing especially for children dude all the children at our parish are so intelligent and wholesome and just being part of that kind of community where you engage with the adults in, through liturgy you're not separated through into kid time with like a dumbed down version of like uh the bible or of christianity like 
it, it really does something to you to engage meaningfully in a whole group with a whole group that like loves you and cares about you. And all the kids at our parish are just the coolest kids. <laughs> yeah, they really are. Like I went skateboarding with one of the 12 year olds yesterday. It was awesome. He's the coolest kid. <laughs> um, yeah. So, I mean, we have more notes that we could get into, but I feel like that's a good place to end it. Cause really it's just us throwing all of this dense, dense information out there. Um, there is actually one thing, another book that I picked up that sort of ties John's book in with what we're going to do next with the Romanian prison camps is this book I found. Uh, <laughs> it's got this lovely title. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's called The Rape of the Mind, The Psychology of Thought Control, Menticide and Brainwashing. It's uh, by this Swedish psychologist, Just Mir Liu. He wrote it in 1956. And like the first half of the book is talking about how um, totalitarian societies uh, force individuals into submission through, you know, like camps and torture and, and things like that. It's, he breaks that down really well. But the second is sort of like mass communications uh, brainwashing people on, on like a, a mass level. And then he has a chapter in here called Technology Invades Our Minds. And I thought that this was so prescient, having been written in 1956. Um, and, and he's, at that time, obviously he doesn't even have internet or computers. He's, talk, he's just talking about TV and radio and like automobiles and things like that. Um, but he sort of sees them becoming something that will invade our minds and, and take away our individuality if we don't if we don't find the right balance with them. And um, this is one, this is a passage from, from that book, from that chapter. It says the world of tomorrow will witness a tremendous battle between technology and psychology. It will be a fight of technology versus nature of systematic conditioning versus creative spontaneity. The veneration of the machine implies the turning of mechanical knowledge into power push button power, mechanical instruments of destruction, such as the H bomb have translated the primitive human urge for destruction into large scale scientific killing. Now this destructive potential may become an easy tool for any potentate crazy for power driven by, driven by technology. Our own world has become more interdependent and through our dependence on technical knowledge and devices, we ourselves are in danger of delivering our people to the more brutal totalitarians. This is the actual dilemma of our civilization. The machine that became a tool of human organization made possible the conquest of nature has acquired a dictatorial position. It has forced people into automatic responses, rigid patterns and destructive habits. Uh, this, this is later in the same chapter. In a mechanical society, a set of values are forcibly imprinted on the unconscious mind the way Pavlov conditioned his dogs. Our brains then no longer need to serve us or develop the thinking process. Machines will do this for us. In technocracy, emphasis is on behavior free of emotions and creativity. We speak of electric brains, forgetting that actually creative minds are behind these brains and their frailties. For some engineers, minds have become no more than electric lamps in a totalitarian laboratory. Between man and his fellow man, there has been interposed a tremendous cold paper force, a nameless bureaucracy of rules and tools. Mecha mechanization has brought into being the mysterious pimp in human relations, the man in between, the mechanical bureaucrat who is powerful but impersonal. He has become a new source of magic fear. Um, so yeah, we went back into the heaviness of all this stuff, but I mean, I think it's important to, to hold both, both things uh, together like the, the the sort of the darkness and the light because because we're in it right now and we need to be able to steal ourselves against it however we can and i think you know life in the church living the spiritual life is is our greatest defense the jesus prayer and as mark so uh, wonderfully presented to us before before that that's our weapon 
and all this stuff. And that's how people like Father George and, and all those uh, martyrs in the Romanian prisons were able to keep their humanity. And that might be something we, we have to face soon. So. Anyway. Yeah, so check out his book. Yeah. Get the book. It's really good. <laughs> It's it's well written. It's very dense. It's definitely like a scholarly tome, but it's worth the read. And John Kleisik's a really cool guy. So we'll have him on again, and we'll have a second part for sure. Yeah, and I guess we'll end it there. Um, where's Mano? <laughs> <laughs> what's going on, boys? I'm right yeah, here. <laughs> How you guys doing? Good, man. That was awesome, man. That was truly, truly awesome. I'm not just saying that. I'm really happy you guys uh, were able to do this with us. Yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad you think so. It's it, it was good to be able to sort of revisit this stuff. Well, and, do, are, you, do you, are you guys in a rush? Do you have a do you have a little bit to ch- sit around and chat? Yeah, 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 let's let's hang out. Awesome, awesome. Um, yeah, no, I, you guys touched on a lot throughout the whole uh, 45 minutes there, or however long it was. Uh, and I don't even know where to begin. All I know is that it, 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 it a good reminder of like all of this stuff is how much we're socially engineered from the beginning, from cradle to grave, really. Yeah. And, uh, and like breaking it down this way and showing people that a lot of the stuff is pre, pre, uh, premeditated. There's experimentation that's constantly being done. Uh, it reminded me a lot of like the names that you guys were mentioning uh, were straight out of like the same names that are mentioned in the changing image of man by Stanford, mm-hmm. uh, uh, by, by Stanford university that they um, published in, in 72, 73. Uh, the experiment started in the 60s and a lot like uh, Julian Huxley's in there. We have Skinner's mentioned in there. Uh, Margaret Mead's mentioned. There, and many, many, many of the names that you guys were mentioning as well are constantly referenced in there. So it's like in, in a lot of the different categories in, in, our, in our lives, they're always trying to engineer us. It's the same people every yeah. time. Yeah, changing images of man's crazy because it shows how calculated it is. Like them yeah. going through older worldviews and saying, well, they thought this is like a premise or an axiom. Therefore, this is going to be the conclusion when this comes up as a problem. Like they have studied worldviews in general. And it's yep. it's definitely like something so that they can guide it in a direction that's useful for their kind of like global technocratic aims. Absolutely. And like that was a, <clears throat> like as you guys were talking, I went and grabbed it and I pulled it out because it was like, oh yeah, it reminds me of Changing Images of the Man. I had to print it out because I'm in Mexico, so I can't carry books around. <laughs> but uh, I was going to like do a lot of like episodes on this kind of stuff. But in the last little while, uh, like I've just, like I'm, I'm just so tired of it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, and, and like even thinking about it, not, not like watching it or hearing it, but I just, I'm just tired of thinking about all this stuff because it's, it's so dark. It's just so dark. <laughs> it's like, it really is. Yeah. So I like that you guys even threw in like uh, don't get black pilled and you gave a lot of solutions because like really that's very important um, and homeschooling, homeschooling and uh, it, it's it's something that we're actually planning on doing uh, a segment about uh, women their their role in the church because mm. I, I I find that they're they're overlooked uh, not on purpose it just it just so happens that the, the online Orthodox space um, it's easy to overlook that position sometimes because we're so combative and and we want to just break things down. But I think uh, a lot of the women out there that are homeschooling uh, mothers and grandmothers and, and uh, sisters and all that stuff, that are, uh, wives, of course, holding it all together, a, lo- a lot of the education uh, comes from them, really. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm really happy because... Of, sorry? Uh, that makes me think of another... Uh, I mean, recently, we're, we're in California, and there's been a lot of uh, uh, discourse lately about the, the recent bill that public schools don't have to tell parents if their kids want to transition and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's a horrible thing, but I mean, we're here in the midst of it and we've like, we were talking about the kids in our parish and I'm sure there are a lot of other strongholds here in California where that's not, we're not going to let that hurt us. You know, we're going to, we're going to be pushing back against that. And it's like, it sucks to hear that in the news and it sounds real bad but um i i mean god's gonna take care of us so we don't need we don't need to be afraid of gavin newsom and his poison pen and we're in a very liberal area in california as if california wasn't liberal enough in general we're in a very liberal area and our parish is totally protected against all of this kind of stuff so yeah, the scary, the scary part is that they're legislating a lot of this stuff too, you know, and, and like, uh, I'm from Canada, as everybody knows, and in Toronto, it's it's like California, so I, I know exactly what you're talking about, and they're legislating a lot of this uh, BS, you know what I mean? 
yeah, and it's scary, but you know. It, but you're you're right with to 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 say that God will protect us for sure. Yeah, and we've seen. I mean, the church has been through so much persecution and, and pain, and that's kind of in a way that's how we thrive. You know, like the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. So, yep. There's right. we have no fear. At least we shouldn't. Sometimes we do anyway, <laughs> but you know. No. I agree, and that's that's part of what we're trying to do with all of all of us, and all, like this this whole project. Uh, not to plug the project, but that this is a big reason why we're doing it is because we need to have an analog and a digital space of a sanctuary of sorts, you know. And uh, we may be distance apart, like physically, but doing this kind of thing, kind of having these types of conversations, helps build community, takes away fear away. I think it's important to kind of look at the darkness. You know, even as specific, specifically and particularly as Orthodox people, we're not afraid of the dark. We shouldn't mm -hmm. be. Uh, and realize that through the Jesus prayer tools like Mark was giving us, uh, a lot of the stuff that you, you guys were also pointing out kind of helps us shine the light in those dark corners. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So it's, it's, um, it's, yeah, I think it's extremely important to, to, to also look at the solutions, which we, we, you guys mentioned homeschooling uh, and, uh, you know, how we can build curriculums within like our communities and how we can do it so that we can have a lot of more of those kids you guys were talking about the skateboarding <laughs> kids and all that They're stuff. so cool yeah that's that's awesome so what's the school there like how does that work do you guys have you guys looked into that like the orthodox school um i'm i'm a little bit out of the loop on that i know our parish used to have a school our parish used to have its own school but it they there were reasons that it had to they had to shut it down but i know that there are a lot of people especially at, at other parishes in the area there is like a pretty tight-knit homeschool community and joseph brought up too he wondered if there was like online curriculums or some sharing kind of forums and there definitely is I, we, were, we have a celtic fair every year and one of the moms from one of the neighboring parishes came over and i'm having a kid soon and she was i was like oh what am i going to do for school and stuff and she's like oh don't even worry about it like there's a big network of us online mostly christian i don't know if it's all orthodox but there's definitely like many christians of different denominations and that all come together being like how how do we have a good homeschool curriculum with traditional things in it that isn't filled with all the modernity? Yeah. And, and it, it's good to kind of put that out there and let people know that these are tools we can use as a community to kind of like build our own thing. Cause I think if we don't build our own arc, not to make a <laughs> biblical comparison, but if we don't build our own arc and get on it, we might be in trouble. I mean, that's, yeah, that's what it is. Yeah. Um, yeah, man, the importance of community, especially in this sort of like, technocratic uh atomized uh space that we're in right now like community is 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 the thing yep i agree i agree and and that's yeah, why our, it's like our mic keeps coming out there. yeah sorry I, you cut you cut out there what did you say sorry oh i was just saying our mic keeps cutting out <laughs> oh okay. <laughs> yes i concur <laughs> but uh but i also like that you guys brought up uh about uh the romanian prisons because um that's definitely a project of yours. I'm really looking forward to, uh, and I'm nudging you guys yet again. You guys get it, get on that, and let me know too, so like I can cross some of my research with it, and maybe we can uh, collab on it. You guys take care of the one side; I'll take care of the other kind of thing, and we'll like do a back and forth or something. Yeah, that could be cool. Yeah. It's been I've been I've just been wanting to read everything possible, but I think I'm just gonna have to calm down and just do it. Just pull the trigger on it because yep. it's like the more I read, the more things I want to pile oh, yeah. up and like yeah it's uh, um, yeah we're just we're gonna have to do it for sure yeah, so yeah i know exactly what that's all about it i mean we've been wanting to do stuff like this for a while and just the last little while we've, been, we've just been more doing than researching uh but i do miss it i do miss getting back to the research and stuff uh, but I, I know exactly what you guys mean but you know what mm -hmm. um yeah, like we don't have to end it right here, but I'm just saying, just because it's on my mind, uh, definitely keep us in the loop. Uh, also, like if there's an, if you guys have an idea or like a little segment you guys want to pop on and just do, we'll take care of all the the garbage you guys don't want to do and just jump on and start talking. You know what I mean? Nice like, man, I love that. Network. Yeah, it sounds great. Yeah, it's this like, was awesome. I awesome. We, I was a little bit worried about how the presentation is going to go. I, I'm glad we had uh, Vanny pulling pulling stuff. Dude, Vanny just crushing it with the yes. media, you know, pulling <laughs> yes. stuff up on Google. Yeah. Yeah, he's yeah, he's so, he's amazing like that. No, this is great. I'm glad you you set this up. Um, I'm excited to see what 
what we do with this in the future because it's a it's a cool little cool little thing that you're setting up here yeah and thanks for thinking of us and having us on dude of course man always you guys are always uh, like on our top 10 for sure 100 percent. so uh what was i gonna say uh yeah so like even if you guys think of a show you guys want to put on let us know that's what the network's for so um just reach out at any point let me know hey man we're thinking about doing this and nine times out of ten i'll probably say yes <laughs> right on man that, yeah that's great awesome awesome well gentlemen thank you guys so very much for uh, for joining us today i mean unless you guys had anything else you want to say and of course if you have anything to plug please do that um really just check out our youtube channel watch that interview with john because he's he's amazing and and jordan's other youtube channel metal mystic oh so yeah sick. I always Check forget about that one. I've got, th- I have the same problem where I, I have like a working script for my next episode. It's been like over a year since I made a video for that, and uh, I just need to make it. They're heavy hitters. They're really, really well done. They are. So, They're really, yeah. really good. Really good. I, I fully agree. I mean, we talked about it last time you guys were on that you got to do more Metal Mystic for sure. So sick. Yeah. Yeah, but I've got it in. Yeah, I've got it coming. It's just it takes so much. Wait. Okay. So. Uh, I don't. I don't want to get into the logistics of it, but yeah, no. <laughs> you we're, totally, yeah. if you want to, don't worry. If you want to, go for it. It's up to you. Uh, no, it's mostly <laughs> just going to be me whining about like having a full time job and not being able to balance all the other stuff. <laughs> so Wait, that's pretty actually, much that, where I'm at. That's perfect timing. That's what our problem is too, right? So that we took a leap of faith on this, and like, like this is what I'm. We're doing. Mo- we're trying to do uh, full time. I mean, we're not making money at it at all, but it's totally mm. a le- leap of faith and. Uh, that is what we're trying to build with this network. Not that I'm like plugging it right now, but I kind of am plugging it. Uh, and we want to have guys like you guys on the network so that this is all you're doing. Unless you want to do something else, this is all you're doing. So our plan is to build this bigger thing, more than just the show. Uh, we're working on platforms and a bunch of other things and other ways of monetizing stuff so that we can have you guys doing this full time so that next time I ask for, come on, man, where's that video? I want to see it. You can't say <laughs> I have a full time job. You know what I'm saying? I say <laughs> <laughs> so like hey, seriously that's, that's what we want yeah that'd be great uh one one last thing about metal mystic since you brought it up <clears throat> uh and for the viewers the reason why i keep interrupting them it's hard to see to know when they're going to talk because i can't see their faces so that's mm-hmm. another thing is when you guys are ever going to do a face reveal i've already asked please let me know do the face reveal on the network <laughs> 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 but uh, yeah in- in terms of the metal mystic, um, there's this running joke on SOS about GG Allen, and I mentioned it with you once when you guys were on the on the show. I'm not uh-huh. a fan of GG Allen whatsoever, but if you ever wanted to do um, like a little SOS radio, we break down GG Allen BS Uri, and uh, and let me know, let me know, we could do that. Yeah, I don't know too much about him, but I guess uh, I could look into him. All I really know is that he's a weird, weird, dirty, crazy man. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's a polite way of putting it. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, I'm not a fan at all, but it's like a running joke. People keep... Who, who is it, Manny, that keeps throwing the Gigi Allen? Is it... It's not... Is it Burrito? Goy Burrito Bar guy? Whatever <laughs> <he's in>. <laughs> Sick <laughs> name. Anyways, yeah, he's, uh, he's awesome. He's like one of the funniest guys I've ever seen in the chat. Anyways, boys... Um, it was great to have you guys on and uh, definitely going to be working with you guys in the future for sure. Awesome, man. Sounds great. Yeah, thanks so much, man. We'll see you soon. Have a good one, gentlemen. Bye-bye. God bless. God God bless you. All right, everybody. That was obviously Synaxis Podcast. I hope you guys enjoyed that segment. Uh, We're going to get ready for an SOS radio, a little bit of an SOS radio break. Uh, Let's see. Before we do that, uh, I wanted to make a few announcements. We're going to have a panel after SOS, we're going to do, uh, Mr. Westford's going to jump on and we're going to do some Prot Rock Prat. What, what, what was the title of it? He had a prot brilliant. Prattle. Pr- yeah, Prot Prattle. Prot Prattle. And that's exactly what it is. So after we're done SOS, uh, Mr. Westford's going to jump on. We're going to do that. And then after uh, the, the, the pratting of the prattling of the Prot Rock or whatever it is, not Prot Rock. Is it, can we call it that? I don't even know. Like, I don't even know what I'm in store for. I'm a little afraid. I'm not going to lie. I remember when I was at the record label at Sony BMG, uh, we were, we were, um, I was working for this little indie record label, and we distroed a lot of these little indie record label band, uh, indie le- record labels. So we were like a distribu- distributing company for a lot of them. And there was a lot of these like weird Christian bands on them, like even like early Under Oath and like some names I don't even remember. But I remember uh, Punchy was throwing some of the band names, something Ash, Under Ash or something like that. 
and like whenever it comes crashing these weird names and and uh it was like just not my thing and it was so weird so i'm a little afraid and at the same time excited to see what uh what uh, West, mr westford's gonna gonna pull out of his pocket and show us it's funny because i'm talking and I, I i i'm used to hearing other people's voices for the last two three hours i'm waiting for someone else to talk and i'm like wait no it's just me it's just me and me and vanny me and vanny and the mannies uh, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Beauty for Ashes. Yes. They're on like uh, Ferret. Ferret record label. The, the record label is called Ferret. And they had all these like Christian rock post-hardcore bands. So it was like, I don't know. Yeah. It wasn't my thing. It wasn't my thing. Mr. Westford's like, ha, <laughs> Under Oath is so good. See, I knew I was going to, I'm going to piss off a lot of you guys. I know for sure, for sure. And it's not just my age because like, even when I was hearing a lot of that stuff, when I was of the age to hear a lot of that stuff, uh, it was just, it was, it's not my thing. It's just not my thing. But I don't know. What am I? I'm a little bit of a jerk when it comes to music. That's why, you know, whatever I play on SOS radio, I legitimately like. Man, are you holding something up? Yeah, I'm just fucking with this filter right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. He's messing with the filter. Tooth and nail. Tooth and nail. Uh, yeah, that's the record label that uh, some cool uh, uh, Protestant music's on. Um, Orthodox Outcast, I always mess up names. I do, even from people I love and bands I love. And like, I have a reading problem, especially when I do it out loud. As Manny Vanny knows well, like I'm sitting here, how do you say that again? And it's like basic words. Uh, but uh, what's his name again? Michael, Michael, no Michael Knotts? Michael Knotts. Michael Knotts. I think he's somehow connected to that record label. Oh yeah, Joseph Beard's jumping in there. Dude, I love Under Oath. I'm so sorry, guys. I apologize. You're gonna hate me. You guys are gonna definitely not like my face when 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 you guys get to those things like Face Down Records. Yes, okay. Face Down Records was one of the record labels we we used to distro. So I was the guy. So picture like you know younger punk rock mano playing reggae and punk rock, and then they're bringing me this Jesus stuff. At that time, like that prot rock stuff, whatever, like that kind of all these. Level, I was like, man, I'm not I'm not doing this. I can't do this. So then now I'm like, uh, you know, spinning Orthodox content and I adore it. I, I do adore it. I do love it. So you know what? That being said, should we just start an SOS radio thing? The, the, the segment? Oh, yeah. Before we do that, before we do that, before we do that. See, see anyone tuning into Board No More Network for the first time? Well, this is the first time. So actually, this is the first. Or SOS radio. If you've never seen an episode of SOS radio, you know, a big, big part of it is just the randomness of it, like the chaos of it. It's, uh, it's controlled chaos. So, of course, we just do whatever we want. We play whatever we want. We have guests on as we will, like whoever we want. We have them on and we do our thing. So let's just uh, say a uh, little bit of a plug for the, for the, record, for the uh, record label, which will, it will be a record label eventually too. Board No More is going all out, all out. Production, uh, publishing, uh, record label, content create, creator label, like the whole thing. We're doing this whole thing. A lot of these bands that Mr. Joseph Beard is throwing in there, I, I worked these albums, man. Face Down, I worked that, that label, boom, right here, Impending Doom. Uh, Comeback Kid, yes, I think I helped put out their third album. I don't even remember it. It was so not my thing. Apologies again. Apologies again. Uh, what was I going to say? Yes. So everybody that's been on so far, we had Mark on, we had Synaxis on, we're going to have Mr. Westford on. Just so everybody knows any of the support that we get from, from this stream, we're all going to split it. Uh, so uh, of course, that's something that we want to do moving forward is make sure that we pay everyone that's, that, uh, does, that works with us. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so if anyone feels like, like supporting the channel, uh, Manny threw up some links there. If you want to support uh, the, our Patreon, uh, we're going to be doing a lot more in the future with the, with the network, uh, but we're also going to be building more as well. A lot of different platforms. Manny, the programmer side of things, he's, we're building something that can't be touched by the uh, powers that be. They won't be able to take us down, so we're building something like that. We're incorporating a lot of blockchain and uh, cryptocurrency into the whole thing. Yeah, we have big visions, crazy visions. This is one of them you're witnessing right now. This is a crazy big vision. Uh, for those of you guys that are just tuning in, this is Board No More Network. My name is Mano Ilia, and riding shotgun with me as always is Vanny Vanamides, Manny, Vanny the Manny. And, uh, you know, we're doing what we do. And this is our very first, uh, yeah, our network pilot thing. You know, that's what it is. What's what it is? It's what it's gonna be. All right, Manny. Should we uh, yep. hit him with a splash? Do you want to hit him with the first splash? Because we didn't throw the first splash down. Uh, well, we're, we're gonna hit the splash 
uh, between us and, and uh, Mr. Westford, but we could do, do another one. Like, why not? Just throw a splash. This but- is Jordan from the Synaxis Podcast, and you're watching the Board No More Network. Board No More. <laughs> That's it, man. That's it. You know what? Since we, we just do things raw, throw up the Mr. Westford one, too. <laughs> Hello, my name is Mr. Westford, and you're watching the Board No More Network. Stick around. Board No More. <laughs> Hello, my name is Mr. Westford, and you're watching the Board No More Network. Stick around. Board No More.